And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Acts chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. Hello again and welcome back. Let's continue our journey with Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. The conversation now turns to love. Sancho asks why Altisidora became enamored of Don Quixote. Don Quixote responds that love is blind, like death. Then he quotes Horace on the equalizing power of death. It assails the noble fortresses, Alcázares, of kings, as well as the humble huts of shepherds. This phrase is clearly important to Cervantes. He cites it in the prologue of Don Quixote part one, as well as in Don Quixote part two, chapter 20, and now again. Note the evolution of the phrase from Latin to Spanish, and then the shift from torres, or towers, in Don Quixote chapter 20, to the Arabic alcáceres, or fortresses, here in chapter 58. Sancho and Don Quixote then discuss the superficial nature of external beauty versus the internal beauty represented by positive values and character. Liberalness and good breeding. Is Cervantes saying that the outward appearance of moriscos should not obscure their interior Christianity? You decide. But let's back up a bit. Another saint surfaces here after the complex review of the four effigies. Francis enters the brief discussion of superstition. Francis was famous for his ability to make animals get along. Does this refer to Muslims, Christians, and Jews? Animals are important throughout this episode. We began with horses mounted by different saints, and now we will see birds, dogs, and bulls. Did you know? St. Francis was the son of a rich merchant who decided to live according to a strict vow of extreme poverty. In the midst of their discussion of love, Don Quixote gets caught up in green nets. Don Quixote found himself tangled up in webs of green thread. We are approaching an understanding of Cervantes' use of textiles. Don Quixote recalls the net that Vulcan used to humiliate Venus and Mars, again indicating the conflict between love and war. Shepherdesses now appear, and their dress is described in great detail. Their skirts were of rich rippled silk shot with gold. The girls begged Don Quixote not to break the threads of their nets. Hold your steps, Sir Knight, and do not break the nets. This contrast between our knight and young girls recalls the encounter between the violent warrior and the little girl of Burgos in the poem of the Cid. Note also how the girls allude to an aristocratic ideal of social harmony. They have come to these woods to role play a pastoral fantasy. In a village that is about two leagues from here where there are many nobles and many hidalgos and rich people, a group of family and friends arranged that with our sons, wives, and daughters, neighbors, friends, and family, we should all come to delight in this spot, which is one of the most agreeable in all of these parts, founding together, all of us, a new pastoral Arcadia. These explicit references to the poetry of Virgil, Garcilaso, and Camoix echo the theme of a violent world giving way to a peaceful pastoral refuge. Their encampment does likewise. We have among these trees placed some tents, which they say are called field tents. Now, Don Quixote compares himself to Acteon when he spied Diana. Though he does not mention them, the illusion has to call to mind the dogs that devoured Acteon when Diana transformed him into a stag. Remember the strange dogs in the prologue of Don Quixote part two? Note Don Quixote's new description of his profession here. My profession is none other than that of revealing myself to be thankful and a benefactor to all types of people. Don Quixote also refers to the global reach of Spain. If these nets, which occupy only a small space, 
were to occupy the entire sphere of the earth, I would search for new worlds through which to pass without breaking them. This intricate conceit refers to the social transition from warrior knight to courtly gentleman, and then to global trade and peace as the proper goals of the Spanish Empire. This Arcadia also includes strong hints at a trans-ethnic ideal. The girls are hunting all types of little birds, which, fooled by the color of the nets, fell prey to the danger that they were fleeing. It's an amazing image, an allusion to the indeterminate color of birds in the exotic oriental poetry of San Juan de la Cruz. Now Don Quixote gives his final harangue of the chapter, this time against arrogance and even more importantly, thanklessness. The worst among the major sins that men commit, although some say it is pride, I say it is ingratitude. Quixotic Mission What color are the nets used to hunt birds by the shepherdesses? A. Black B. Green C. Red Correct answer, B. Green Finally, Don Quixote proclaims his plan to perform a feat of honor in recognition of his gratitude to the young girls who invited him to join their pastoral fantasy. I say that I shall maintain for two whole days in the middle of this royal highway which leads to Zaragoza that these counterfeit lady shepherd girls here present are the most beautiful damsels and the most courteous in the world, with the single exception of the peerless Dulcinea of Toboso. This is all very amusing, but when Sancho praises his master's discretion, Don Quixote inexplicably erupts in anger, his face inflamed and choleric and with great fury and signs of anger. Contrary to his recent pacific description of his vocation, our mad Hidalgo assumes his antiquated militant role again, like his insane attack of the penitents in chapter 52 of part one. There's no obvious reason here for Don Quixote's behavior. Indeed, his Arcadian audience is as confused as the reader, making them doubt whether they should take him as mad or sane. But wait, like his effort to save the virgin from the penitents, is there not some logic here? Don Quixote's objection to Sancho seems crazy. Who gave you the right to meddle in my things and to determine whether or not I'm intelligent or a fool? But is affirming and defending the dignity of women really foolish? Upon closer inspection, Don Quixote's defense of the beauty and manners of the pastoral girls imitates the pass of honor alluded to in chapter 49 of part one that famous chivalric episode from the 15th century involved Don Quixote's own ancestor, Gutierrez Quijada. Here, in the middle of the road to Zaragoza, we are again invited to contemplate the essence of Don Quixote. All of the people of the pastoral flock, desirous to find out how far his arrogant and never before seen pledge would lead. Don Quixote is absurd. He pierced the air with these kinds of pronouncements. And then come the bulls. Notice that the devil is expressly not involved in this conflict. Instead, according to one of the drovers, Don Quixote himself is diabolical. Get out of the way, you devil, or these bulls will tear you to shreds. It's a tragic fall. And as per the series of saints at the beginning of the chapter, it's also a Christian fall, like the ultimate lesson of Saul's conversion to Paul. Thus, afterwards, knight and squire, with more shame than pleasure, they went on their way. Thank you for joining me in this chapter. Hope you can join me in the next one too. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.